Well, I'm going to going to talk to you about a few other ways in which these next few decades will be a quintessentially important period and a transformative period. Uh, when I was five years old, I decided I would be an inventor. And when I was eight years old, I remember my grandfather coming back from Europe and telling me in sort of a religious fervor how he had been given the opportunity to actually touch uh, some written version of Leonardo da Vinci's ideas. And uh, I saw those actually again at uh, Bill Gates' house. And uh, he described it in reverential terms. And that was really the religion I grew up with in my family, the power of human ideas. So it's exciting to be at this conference. And, but I discovered another idea that timing was important, particularly if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, inventor, innovator. And then most inventors fail because they get the timing wrong. Not all the enabling factors are in place when they need to be. So realizing that maybe 30 years ago, I, and being an engineer, I gathered a lot of data on technology trends and started to see if I could fit mathematical models to that and found out that despite the common wisdom that you can't predict the future, certain things about the future are very predictable. Basically, if you can measure the underlying information content of a process, it follows amazingly predictable trajectories, which is really not what I had expected. For example, the price performance of computing, going back to the 1890 census, has been a very smooth, doubly exponential curve through thick and thin, through war and peace, through boom times and, and recessions and depressions. I mean, there was a lot of history in the 20th century, two world wars, the Cold War, the Great Depression, and a few other things happened. And despite all of that, uh, despite all the vagaries of human history, you've got this very smooth, very predictable trajectory. And I say this now not just looking backwards and overfitting the past data. I've been making these forward-looking predictions since about 30 years ago. My uh, first book, The Age of Intelligent Machines, which I wrote in the 1980s, describes quite well the 1990s and early 2000 years. I saw the ARPANET doubling every year. It was really not on anybody's radar screen. Uh, a few thousand scientists were using it. It went from 10,000 nodes to 20,000 to 40,000. But doubling every year is multiplying by 1,000 in 10 years. So I figured this would be 20 million going to 40 million, 80 million, 160 million nodes in the mid-1990s and would be a World Wide Web. Not by that name, but th I did describe that concept pretty well. Uh, tying together hundreds of millions of people, uh, providing access to, to knowledge sources and so on, uh, emerging in the mid-1990s. I saw the chess supercomputers doubling every year, which added 40 points to the chess score, because the chess score is a logarithmic scale. That put the crossover in 98. I made that prediction in the early 80s. Kasparov scoffed at that in 93, which made sense based on his experience then, but they did soar past him in 97. And I talked about the democratizing effects of decentralized electronic communication, that the Soviet Union, which was then going strong, was really doomed because of the information sharing and the democratizing power of decentralized electronic communication. And I think that's what happened in the 91 coup against Gorbachev. And I did have the occasion to share that with uh, Gorbachev uh, a couple of years ago at lunch. And he said, yes, yes, that's what happened. Uh, I figured anything that would uh, put down Yeltsin would, uh, would get a strong uh, response. Because if you remember, the photo op was Yeltsin standing on a tank. But it was really the clandestine network of decentralized communication, fax machines, early forms of email using teletype machines that kept everybody in the know and broke the back of the, of the centralized control of information. And this has also been very democratizing in terms of the tools of creativity. Now, a couple of kids can go into space or they can write a new web browser on their $1,000 laptops and create a company worth $150 billion today. Or a, couple, a you know, kid in her dorm room can create a full-length motion picture with a $600 HD camera and her PC. So the tools of creativity are really in all of our hands. And what these uh, formulas or, or uh, predictable trajectories tell us is that the power of information technology, its price performance, its capacity, its bandwidth, is growing exponentially. Right now, it's doubling in less than a year. That rate of doubling is, in fact, itself getting faster. It took three years to double the price performance of computing in 1900, two years in 1950, 
it was 12 months in the year 2000, it's now down to 11 months. Even just one level of exponential growth, doubling every year, is multiplying by 1,000 in 10 years, a million in 20 years, a billion in 30 years. When, when I was a student at MIT, they had one computer, which took up a whole building, and the computer in your cell phone today is a million times smaller, a million times cheaper, and a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion-fold increase since I went to MIT. That, that was 40 years ago. Uh, we'll make another billion-fold increase, and also 100,000-fold shrinking in size in the next 25 years, as formidable as information technology is already. And it's not just computers or communications. It's, it's, it's going to affect everything we care about. Solar energy is going to get far more efficient because of the exponential growth of the efficiency of, of solar panels. Uh, our ability to reprogram the software that's running in our bodies, which is outdated, and that'll be the topic of my talk tomorrow, is growing exponentially. We can simulate, we can model biological processes as information processes. And these, these genes, which basically evolved thousands of years ago when conditions were quite different, we now have the ability to, to reprogram, just the way you reprogram the software on your handheld computers. Uh, we can turn genes off with RNA interference. We can add new genes with new forms of gene therapy. And these technologies, which are now formative, will be a thousand times more powerful in 10 years, a million times more powerful in 20 years. And we really will have the ability to reprogram this outdated software and radically extend human longevity. So all the more reason to you know, keep track of your health the old-fashioned way for a little bit longer so we can take advantage of, of that process. So I want to give you one example of how I've applied this to my own technology work. Uh, I have used these uh, prediction tools to write books and talk about what the future will be like in 10 or 20 years. So we can invent with the technologies of the 2020s. We can't build those machines now, but we can envision them, imagine them, and, and write about them, and, and dialogue about their implications. But technology is moving so quickly now that even the four, five, six-year horizon of technology projects uh, is sufficient uh, that the world will be a very different place in a short period of time. So I've been involved for